We are Troy and Penny Maxwell, the senior pastors of Freedom House Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we want to welcome you to our YouTube channel. That's right. You can catch all of our messages, all of our services. There's incredible worship, and I know God's going to touch it in a powerful way. Absolutely. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube right. channel. Come on, Freedom House, Come 20, on, years. 20 years. How cool is that? So much fun. One of my favorite moments was when they got in that backhoe and they broke ground at Central Campus. Pastor Penny was in there like, <laughs> I absolutely have loved our 16 years here at Freedom House and it's due to their vision and their faithfulness to the vision of Freedom House Church and we're just so grateful. Uh, and more than that, we're grateful for the fact that they are the spiritual parents to us um, but in addition, they're the spiritual parents to so many of you and to the people of this city. Truly, we can look at Pastor Troy and Penny's lives and go, you know what? They have enough faith. I'm going to follow that. And I'm just so grateful for the faith that this house was built on. Yeah, there's so much faith over the years that has been put forth. And I see so many lives that have been changed. I mean, honestly, that's what keeps us coming to Freedom House is because we see the move of God every single week. Yes. It's not just a one-time happening. No, it's all seven days because it's not just what we have here. It's what we do out there too. I get excited every Sunday. Every Sunday. <laughs> get rejuvenated about the call on our lives, the call on your life, and the call on their lives that has started it all. So it's so cool to see lives dramatically change. That's what I'm all about. I'm all about life change, whether it's guys, families, women, whatever it may be. I mean, we've seen so many miracles take place over the years. And today we wanna do something a little bit special. Uh, so we want to show you guys a little bit of the journey of Freedom House. Now, there's no way we can pack 20 years into the next little bit, but we're going to do our best to show you what the foundation of Freedom House is and how this house was built on faith. And so we want to show this to you. There's going to be some tears. There's going to be some laughs, some great pictures along the way. <laughs> so enjoy this next documentary for you guys. This is what you're a part of. You are part of Freedom House. Can you believe we're talking about our 20-year 20 20 church Crazy. anniversary? <laughs> Very exciting. Yeah, and 30-year and wedding anniversary. That's right. right. Non-Christian, went to church with my grandparents, but that was about Stole it. Stole his offering money. Yeah, I would go use my offering money that my grandma gave me with the pastor's son to play video games and buy candy during church. Yeah. So I, I knew, I understood church, but I didn't know Jesus, didn't have a relationship with God. It wasn't until I was 21 that I became a Christian, and that's when I met her. It took about a month for my salvation experience to happen. Yeah. And so I thought I could do church, but then when I met God, everything changed. As a result of that, there was a progression of serving. We did, I didn't realize this, but we did everything in the church that we were at. I mean, from, I was an usher, we were greeters, youth ministry, you name it, we did it all, not realizing that God was really preparing us. And we took the youth ministry from about 25 or 30 kids to over 300 when we left, all volunteer. Do you remember the moment when God spoke to us about where we were supposed to go and how that happened? Absolutely. 2001, you know, we had been serving in youth ministry for a long time, and I think we both felt like there was gonna be a change. It was very unsettling for both of us. And so we prayed, and we felt like the Lord said, I want you to go plan a church. I had to go out of town, and I woke up that morning, and I said, honey, I feel like today God's gonna give us an answer of what we're supposed to do, where we're supposed to go. I come back that evening and I remember driving in and God had spoke to me. Like, I know exactly where we're supposed to go. 
So she was at home. She met me in the driveway with the kids in tow. And we meet and I go, I know where we're supposed to go. And she goes, I know where we're supposed to go. And so we had this little argument of, you tell me, I'll tell you. But you have you. to understand, anywhere in the world was open. Any country, any city, any state. Yeah, we had decided state, anywhere. We could go anywhere. Anywhere. And so we argued for a few minutes and I said, okay, I'm just gonna count to three of my both. Yeah, because right. he was like, you go first. And I'm like, no, you go first. And he's like, no, you. And I was like, you're the head of the house, you go first. And he was like, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do one, two, three, and then we're gonna say it at the same time. Yeah, so I said one, two, three, and we both said Charlotte. Now, shocking, because neither one of us had ever been to Charlotte. We had only driven through the city one time. We here. didn't know anybody here. We didn't have any connections here. When you hear that story, you're like, there's no way that's real. But that's how much God was trying to just sow into our hearts exactly what we were going to do. And when you look over, you know, 20 years, you're kind of blown away as that was the beginning point. We can say, yes, God, we'll move. We'll pick up our family. We'll go to a city we've never been to do something we've never done. We have no idea how to do it, and we're probably not gonna get any help. We can always go back to that driveway and remember God told us to be here, and he'll be here while we're here. So we, we ended up getting the 10th on our list school building that was available. I think it was the dirtiest, oldest school that yep. we could possibly find. We went to, actually got invited to Atlanta uh, to meet Dennis and Colleen Rouse, pastor. They were pastor in a church. They had been there for like 15, 16 years. And he asked me, he goes, hey, what's your vision for the church? Now, I, first of all, I didn't even know what vision was, but I just said, hey, I, I just wanna be a church that reaches people. I feel like there are people who are far from God. I feel like there are people that have been burned by church and I wanna meet everybody from both ends and in between. So he said, the unchurched and the overchurched, that's my goal. Yeah, and so he said, what were you gonna call it? I said, Freedom House. He goes, oh, that sounds like a drug rehab facility. And I was like, well, the reason why we picked Freedom House is John 8, Jesus is talking to the Jews that believed in him, and he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that jumped off the page at both of us. And we realized that we were gonna be a church that spoke the truth, and that truth would bring freedom. We didn't know how to start a church. I read one book, Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren. That was my church planting book. I actually read it 14 times. Because okay. of what he did, we decided, all right, we're gonna have a big Saturday. And that first weekend, we had about maybe 60 people show up because we had people from yeah. Richmond that came We did an ice cream giveaway the day before. We had and met so a family, remember that family we met that owned the ice cream truck? And so they came yeah. and they did the ice cream truck. And then our first service we had on Sunday morning. Yeah. I remember the message that I preached. Do you know why I don't remember it? Because you were in children's ministry. Because Matter of fact, you were in children's ministry for probably five years. I would say technically the first service, which we started September the 8th of 2002, uh, we had about 35 people that started the church in a little, and that's including kids. One of the things that we did, our marketing plan, you may remember this, we did a mailing. And so one of the things that we would do is we would be out in the community, you know, whether we were at a gas station, a grocery store, or at Walmart, or we're walking through and we're handing out cards to people, inviting them to church. I moved to Charlotte in the university area of 2002. And the reason I came to Charlotte was because I had gotten accepted to be on staff with a college ministry called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. So I was doing Walmart full-time and then the college ministry part-time. And one day uh, I ran into Pastor Penny, according to her. I actually ran into him with my cart. I don't remember all that, but I'm sure that's probably what happened. So I showed up uh, that Sunday. It was probably their third or fourth service. I didn't know that. But when I walked out, I knew that that was where I needed to be. I was like, you know what? This is where God is gonna challenge me and I need to stay here. Mm -hmm. And so he helped put chairs away and that was the beginning yep. of Michael's ministry. So he was at Walmart waiting for us to meet him. He claims to love setup and breakdown. He does. He does. He, he likes setup and breakdown and I never could understand, but I'm just thankful because it's- Best certainly... thing to build teams in any church is set up and breakdown. Second time I was there, third time, I was like, well, these chairs can't stay in this gym for school, so just help him put up chairs for me. I also helped break down all the equipment. 
uh, on the platform. And I, I enjoyed the setup and breakdown and the camaraderie and the physical activity. So I remember a lot of that every weekend. Right now, there is nothing that you have done that is I just knew God was taking us to a new season. Something was gonna change. And so we looked at different churches for like six months, um, visited a lot of different churches in the area. And um, we found Freedom House online and decided to, to try one Sunday. We were meeting in University Meadows Elementary School. We came into the cafetorium and uh, never forget that first service. When we left that day, I remember looking at Tammy and just saying, this is it. Yep. It's just always felt like home. We bought a house in Monroe and the house came with a trampoline. And this was before kids, so naturally we didn't need a trampoline. And so we posted it on Craigslist and this family responded to the ad. They came to the house. It was a wife, mm -hmm. a husband, and two little girls. Right. And as they were coming to pick up the trampoline, they were talking about their church and they said, do you guys have a church? And we said, no, but we're looking for one. We had tried so many churches in Charlotte and just couldn't find one that fit. And they said, you should check out ours, it's Freedom House. So we waited a couple weeks, we went, and um, man, it was just an incredible experience. Pastor Troy was preaching, the worship was on point, and we just felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. So going into an elementary school cafetorium was a very unique experience and took some growing, I think, for us to kind of get used to. I loved it. Yeah. Matt, he had to experience it a few times for yeah. it to really grow on him. Honestly, the only thing that kept me coming back was Pastor Choi's uh, preaching, his message. And it wasn't long before Freedom House really felt like home. Yeah. We found Freedom House about 16 years ago. We were doing an online search, trying to find a church that really we, we could plug into that was local. We just decided we needed to be somewhere where we could plug in locally and really um, pour our lives into the church. Because okay. the very first time we walked in Freedom House, Pastor Michael said, hey, welcome to Freedom House, and gave me a big old hug. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's different. Yeah. Never walked into a church before that gave me a hug on the way in and just made me feel that welcome. Yeah, and the preaching uh, right away was all about Jesus, and it was very just centered on God and, uh, you know, centered on the Word, and we knew right away that that's exactly what we were looking for. And the thing I liked about Pastor Troy was he went really deep, but made it very practical mm -hmm. to where it wasn't over my head, mm -hmm. but man, I could take it and apply it to my life that day. You know, we kind of knew what it took to make church happen, um, but <clears throat> had never seen it in a school. And when you can turn a school cafeteria and gymnasium into a church, it's pretty amazing. And I quickly realized it took a lot of commitment. If people weren't committed, you know, the church wasn't gonna grow. And clearly they were committed because it was amazing to see what was going on. At that time, we were driving from, we lived uh, in the university area, we would drive past the property that we now have a building on. 27 acres of land, and here we are, nobody knew who we were. We just had a handful of people in the church. And Troy said, I'm gonna call the owner and see if he's gonna sell it to us. Yep. And I was like, all right. And he calls the owner and the owner all but hangs up on him, says no. When it came to our first building, I remember when Pastor Troy and them, when it was just a dream, we didn't have land we were thinking of. And I, I'll never forget the name of that first building campaign that we were raising support for. From the church perspective, we started doing some campaigns around trying to, to raise money. The first one was called On the Brink. On the Brink. Because we, we're getting on the brink, like getting ready to cross over the Jordan. Yeah, it was 1.5 million for 27 acres, and it was 1.5 million more than what we had. The owner of the property comes and he goes, listen, I've tried every which way to get this property yep. sold and I'm about to lose a big tax benefit and I just need you guys to buy this property and I'll even finance it for you. Would you please buy yep. the property? If you can just give me $200,000, I will finance the 1.3 interest only for three years. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Now we didn't have $200,000. <laughs> 
but God told us to do it. And so. But he signed his name on that agreement, agreement anyway. Yeah, I signed that agreement and just believed in faith that God would provide the finances. And, and he did. Our next building campaign was called Imagine a Place. Yep. And getting people to believe and see something that wasn't here yet. We moved from the, the school we were at, University Meadows. They had built a school across the street. So we moved there in 2009. Which smelled a little better, but was still a school because it was newer. And then it was across the street from the property that had been purchased, which was exciting because we could at least look across the street and know where we were going. We wanted to be able to say across the street yep. is our new church home. Yep. Think about how the people had to use their faith because at that point we hadn't built a building yet. One of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to get everybody onto the property so they could experience and feel the ground underneath their feet and be there. And so we uh, rented a huge tent. We had to clear the field and cut down all the briar patches and everything, put this massive tent up. And we decided to do something a little bit different on the groundbreaking. Remember what we did? We didn't do a shovel, we did a backhoe. Absolutely, absolutely. We got into a backhoe and I learned how to work the backhoe. <laughs> and so I got in there and the band was playing. We had a service. After the service, I got in there and we went down. It was, it was awesome, it was epic. The hype and excitement of that transition to man, we're gonna finally be in our own building and to see something that you've given towards, you've poured into, you've prayed for become a reality was was pretty special. Now me being on the setup and teardown team, um, I miss that, but it's also pretty awesome to walk in on Sunday and like everything's ready to go. So once we finally got it built, we only could put five children's classrooms in the building. Yeah, we built this building during the recession and the bank decided that they weren't going to loan us the amount of money that was originally intended. And so we couldn't even add the kids wing to the building at that point. And we pushed through, Pastor Penny came up with this amazing idea to keep the kids over at Stony Creek Elementary and they would come into service with us and they would participate in worship. Yes. And, and then, then we'd release them onto a double decker party bus. It was an English yeah. red party bus. We went from the school to the new building and within two weekends, we grew 35%. I mean, the church did. Did your preaching get better? Nope. Did the children's ministry get better? It probably got a little worse because we had to we had to split all the kids up. No, no what, <laughs> it's something about building a building that says to people, You're we real. are now a permanent mark in this community, community and we aren't going anywhere. So putting a stake in the ground is very important. And, and that showed us because in one weekend, our church grew 35, 40%. But it was exciting because like, here we are in this brand new facility but God's moving so fast, we already need to expand it. So that was, um, the expectation was still there. It's not like, hey, we've made it here and we've crossed the finish line, now let's kind of coast. It was, hey, we're in this building, now let's make it bigger. Hey, I'm Troy Maxwell, pastor of Freedom House Church right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And hey, I'm Penny Maxwell and these are our kids. We just wanted to invite you and your family to come join me and my family for one of our weekend services at Freedom House. That's right, at Freedom House, we love people. We, we started love thinking people. about coffee, really coffee. the idea of being the local church in every local community. But we also knew that we had to expand our building. We knew we needed more classrooms. We needed to get the kids out of the school back all together in one room, one, one space. We decided that we were going to raise some more money and expand, basically double the size of our facility. Add yeah. children's class, expand the lobby, add a loft area. And so we went from 750 to around 1100, you know, 11, 1150. And then we added another seven classrooms, went from five created the connect lounge more of a coffee shop bigger lobby you know we had in our mind that we didn't want to just have a big auditorium we also wanted to big, have a big lobby we were a fellowship church we love to hang out with people and so I, we believe that just as much ministry happens in the lobby as it does 
in the auditorium. I'll never forget something he said as he got up to the church. He announced the, the plan and what we were going to do because we were busting at the seams and, you know, we needed to do some different things to grow. And he got up and he told the church, he said, you guys, I am so excited as we take this next step. He said, but I want you to know this. This is the cool thing. We have all the money we need. And he laid out the budget and he said, we have every dime that we need. He said, but it's just in your pocket. And then what we did is we put plastic up and we began to take the walls out and the building just began to grow and expand. More concrete got poured. And then we added in a whole new wing. Uh, kids it's space. fantastic. And then, then we started to think about, all right, we did this here in the university area. We really wanna be a church that people can drive to within 15 to 20 minutes. We started to think, all right, where could we go next? And that's when really cool stuff started to happen. We had been looking around for a second campus and we just said, God, wherever you want us to go, we had been looking around the south part of Charlotte. We had a snow day here and we decided to cancel services, um, but some people were already on the way. And uh, so we had a very small service. We live streamed it. We decided, hey, why don't we go out for lunch afterward and just hang out a little bit since it's, it's a small group. So we did, we went to Jim and Nick's barbecue, hung out for a little while. And I remember Pastor Troy sitting across from a gentleman and the gentleman slid him a piece of paper. He reads the piece of paper and he goes, oh, that's nice. And he pushes it back over to the guy. I said, Troy, read it again. And it says, give Troy and Penny the South End building. And Troy said, well, I just got to ask you one question. Are there strings attached? And he goes, because if there are, I'm going to push it back again. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm waiting for the guy's answer. And he goes, no, Pastor Troy, no strings, no strings attached. So that was the beginning of us acquiring. It was a shell of a building. We had to sink in no $3 air million. Dollars. No, I mean, it was bad. No plumbing, no, no AC, no, parking, no flooring, no flooring. I mean, we had to gut the entire building, which was fantastic. I mean, it was a great process. So we put $3 million into that and our kingdom builders stepped up again and we opened that campus not long after it. We had South End come to life. Yep, and we had no idea the influence that that campus would have. After we started South End, we had cast the vision to start another campus the following year which we knew we wanted to do in the Lake Norman area. We purchased a sound system for the school to invest in the school, which we would do often around the community. You know, because we started in the school, we wanted to give back to the school. So we do that at schools all over the city. And at Huff High, we had done the same thing. And they invited us, says, why don't you, you know, start a, start a church here? And so we did. <laughs> and so, which is crazy. We go back to set up and set break, up and break down. down. Right. And so, and it was great. I mean, the church grew, it started to expand. And with that happening, we immediately said, well, we need to find a building for this place. Especially since we had done set up and break down in the past, we were able to, you know, kind of do 2.0. who led that? Pastor Michael. Pastor Michael He's did. He's the one, he did it. Yep. And he loved it and he loved it. And if we ever do it again, he'll probably be the guy that leads <laughs> it again. Lake Norman, I was actually, we were both part of the launch team there. Partly because it was going to be set up and break down, which South End was not. We were the OGs. Uh, yeah, and I was one of the only people that had been around when we did set up and break down. Plus, it kind of falls in my wheelhouse. I still love that aspect. I love the camaraderie it builds between that team. Um, I was a little older when we launched Lake Norman, so my physical body responded a little differently. Uh, but I still loved it. Our kids got involved. Our kids still talk about the set up and break down and how much they enjoy doing that. So that was probably, that was, it was good for our family to, to kind of, to do all that together yeah. and enjoy that. So we found a facility that we could do a lease to purchase and we began the renovations of that facility that at the time was a workout facility, had been a lot of the things prior to that. But uh, and it's kind of cool because you see people that come to Lake Norman now that are like, I used to work out in this uh, building. <laughs> And so we begin the renovation and we're able to get in there. Uh, and now we've moved from that lease to where we've actually purchased that building. Lake Norman is actually our fastest, fastest growing, growing campus. campus. Fastest so growing we, campus. as soon as we moved in that building, again, it, something happens when you make a permanent stake in the ground 
people now understand that you're not going anywhere. That's right. Something that I appreciate about Freedom House and each one of our campuses is that you can walk into any of them and you feel like you're at Freedom House, mm -hmm. whether you're at South End, Lake Norman or Central, even if you've never been to any of the other ones, if you go from Central to South End, you, you know you're at Freedom House. There's just something that's very distinct about it, even though it's very South End or very Lake Norman. Uh, and so that's something that's always exciting when we take people that have only been at Central to South End or one of the other locations. I think we all realize that the last three years have been extremely challenging. We have seen a tremendous turn in our church. We believe, I believe that when the men go up, the church goes up. And so what we decided to do is we're gonna put our money where our mouth is, and then God puts on our radar uh, a lodge, a mountain lodge, a retreat center for men. And so at the beginning of the year of 2022, we decided, you know what, we're gonna invest in our men. We're not just gonna just keep talking about it, we're gonna invest. And so we purchased 45 acres in Marion, North Carolina, a beautiful piece of property. God has a calling on their life, and I believe that that is gonna be a place that they're gonna find their calling. Yeah. And our leaders have already went up there. We've completely bathed that place in prayer, and we just know that life change is gonna take place on that property. So I'm super excited about the future. I'm super excited about our men's movement, and what's going on there. And uh, Strong continues to grow because I, th I feel like the men are really rising up. Because there's a couple the areas in society that the devil was strategically attacking and yeah. one is the men. Right. And the other area was our children. Caused us to really take a step of faith because for 20 years, I said, we're never gonna start a school. We're never gonna do anything like that. Matter of fact, people would come up to me all the time and go, hey, when are you gonna start a school? And, and I said, say, never. never. When you pay for it, when you run it, when you do everything. We couldn't sit by and just not do anything. I said, we have to yeah. do something. So we started Freedom Academy. And, and it is And we're, we're just incredible. in the infancy part of it, but we know it's gonna be a, a huge impact. The legacy that we wanna leave I believe that these buildings will be bigger, will be influencing more people, all not in the memory of Troy and Penny, but in the influence of the vision that we left to equip people to experience Christ's freedom in their everyday lives. And so I, I, my prayer, my heart is, is that when we're gone, that people will, um, will grab hold of that, the handles of freedom and be able to continue to ride that wave throughout history and not just be a church that's one generational, but a church that's gonna be multi-generational, which doesn't happen very often. One of the things I've learned in leadership, uh, especially being a Christian leader, pastor, is there's a big difference between success and significance. Success is what happens to you. Significance is what happens through you. And that's what I want us to to leave as a legacy is not what happened to Troy and Penny or even to Freedom House Church, but what happened through us. The legacy that we leave, the significance that we leave in the foundation of not just Charlotte, but maybe around the country, the, the young pastors that we've had influence in. And that's why it's so important that we're doing what we're doing and that we're partnering with the people we're partnering with and why each person at Freedom House has such a significant part to play in that because it's not just Troy and Penny doing something. Troy and Penny are just two people. It, it's not the faith of one or two, but it's the faith of many who joined in along the way and chose to accept the call. It wasn't just Troy and Penny that accepted the call. It's a lot of people that put their hand to the plow and said, we wanna be a part of this because we are choosing significance as well. And that's a big deal. Yep. Uh, I know for us, some of the teachings and things we did early on, I remember we first started having kids, that some of the stuff we learned early on was huge in the way that we parented, in the way that we spoke blessing over our kids. Uh, and that just revealed to me that, hey, Sunday the church is needed, but it's for the purpose that people go out and live their life because that's the, that's the brunt and bulk of how we walk out our life. It's not just in a Sunday service. But, and I don't even want to say too much because it's like I don't want to put limits on God. I just feel like the sky is the limit with what Freedom House can become 
And it's not about the buildings. It's not about that. It's about the people. You know, you see incredible leaders here. You see incredible families that just love God. You see people getting discipled, people getting changed. But in 18 years, we've seen a church that met in a school that you saw the glimmer of something special turn into a multi-site church of thousands that is respected around the country and around the world. And to see our pastor's vision advance has been truly special. I'm proud of the pastors sticking to their guns in the past 20 years. No matter what has come, where they've gone, or, or what's going on, they have stuck to their guns on what God has given them. Our reach is well beyond the United States, and we're seeing lives change across the globe because of Freedom House and the messages we're able to bring to them. So where are we going in the future? I believe that God's just gonna continue to entrust Freedom House with more properties, with more campuses, with more reach uh, through our online campus. The one thing I love about Pastor Troy and Pitty is that they are, they're always casting vision. They're always, there's always a next step. And um, because they know that where there is no vision, the people will perish. So it's always been, hey, this is when we got, it was always, we're gonna get in a permanent facility. And when we got in the permanent facility, it was, hey, we're gonna expand this thing and make a huge kid's wing and be ready for super growth. And then we added on to the auditorium. And then as soon as we got in that space, it was now let's go multi-site. And um, which is always exciting to get behind and always um, good to know that they're always tuning into God saying, hey God, what's, where do you want us to take ground next? Because we're gonna keep, we're not gonna stop. We're not gonna sit and you know coast into retirement. We're gonna keep pushing. I'm most proud that we're still married. We still love each other and we're still friends. And we're still standing strong. The church is still, I would say the same thing, that we lasted through the storms. Because so many times, unfortunately, you see where the storms and the winds are blowing and they blow hard. When you're in ministry, and a lot of people think being the one on the platform is great, but the one on the platform is the one who also takes the most heat. And one of the things that we said a long time ago is none of it means anything if we don't come through all of that and weather the storms we wanna, well. We both wanna finish well. So another 20 years, I'll be 73. I'll still be going strong, still doing CrossFit. <laughs> and I'll still be cooking, watching right. you do CrossFit. Right. <laughs> but I wanna finish well. I think we wanna finish well. Yeah, we point to little old couples that are walking down the beach holding hands and we go, like, I'm starting we to cry. Be, we we say that. that, I want that to be us where we can look back and say, with every ounce of our breath, with every ounce of who we are, On when we table. stand before yep. the Lord, that we literally answered the call and did every single thing He asked us to do, even when it was hard, we fulfilled the vision. when it was difficult. That's right. we, we said yes to Him, and that when we stand before Him, that we won't have any regrets, that we'll say, it was hard, it was difficult, but we never quit, we never stopped, we never quit pushing forward. <laughs> oh. Come on, isn't that awesome? Can we give Jesus a big hand clap? Exciting, very exciting. Love it, love it, love it. Maybe seated, Man. just for a few more minutes. It, it's so incredible just to take a look back, but how many of you know we're not done? We're, we're talking right now about our, our further south Charlotte campus that'll be coming around, and, and how many of you understand and know that it's not even just the people that are sitting in our campuses, but it's people all around the world that we get to impact. As a matter of fact, right now, not only do we have North Carolina, but we've got South Carolina, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Indiana, Illinois, Georgia, Kentucky, New York, Hawaii, California, Massachusetts, Florida, Arizona, and the Netherlands watching. Isn't that great? You know, when I was watching the video, I just started thinking about, uh, you know, saw people's faces that I hadn't seen for years, and we had a couple people that came to the first service that were actually at the first service. Uh, one of the guys that was one of my good friends led worship for the first two weekends. And I just think about all the life change. I, I think about the marriages that are still together 
you know. I remember sitting in my office with them and they, they wanted out and God restored their marriage. And I, I remember, I just think of all the miracles that have happened, the cancers that the have been The barren wombs that God Yeah, opened. all the babies that, that have been born that I remember them standing at the altar. They weren't supposed to be. Yeah, they weren't supposed to be born. And God, the destinies, the people that are in ministry, the people that are serving God and just fulfilling the call. It's amazing to think about um, that we get to be a part of that. That's what church is. You know, I, I think sometimes we just wrap it up into a building and something we do for an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday morning, but it's so much more than that. And that's what we look at. You yeah. know, that's the way we see it. And, and we're glad. And I, I say this all the time, and I've been signing my name, you know, whenever I write a note to you, I say, I love being your pastor, because it's true. We really do love being your pastors. We enjoy it. It's hard. Sometimes you get on our nerves, but we still love you. We it's, really it's, do. It's Just like being your, honest. It's I mean, like I have to be your honest. kids sometimes. You know, you, you have to do what you have to do as a parent, and they yep. don't always love it. Yep. But you understand that your job is not for them to always love you. Your job is that they get into heaven. That's right. That's right. That's right. And sometimes you have to make the hard calls, and we have had to do that many a times. Uh, we've actually been pastoring for 30 years, but we planted this church uh, 20 years ago. We started off as youth pastors and kids path. We did everything when we were at our church in Richmond, but you know why we did it? We did it because we've always loved God's house. Yep. God's house has always been a priority for us. It's always been a priority for our family. When our kids were little, they would force us to drive back from vacation early because they did not want to miss church. That's right. That's right. It's sure. all about your family. It's about all of us growing deeper in our relationship with the Lord. And I want to tell you, this is the honest to goodness truth, how we feel as your pastors. It's never one time been a have to. It has always been a get to. Yep. We yep. get the we get honor and the privilege to serve the Lord and the way that we do. And I hope that shows because our passion for you, our passion for God's house has never relented, not one That's time right. Right. in the last 20 years. Yep. We're not perfect, but man, we're giving it our best shot. And we're gonna keep doing it for 20 plus more years and keep reaching out and keep building and keep growing and keep reaching people. And, and you know, See, now, now we're old, we're older. And we get to really help these young guys, young pastors. We used young. to be the ones that would call, yeah. you know, asking all the older pastors for help. And how do you do this? And how do you do that? And we were like, you know what? We're those people now. I know they call us. We're the ones that everybody calls. We're the ones that are always getting on a plane. Do you know how hard it is for us to constantly be on a plane, living out of a suitcase, but there are other pastors that need what we've spent 30 years developing and honing, and we will always be there yeah. for them yep. because the church, the body of Christ is That's so right. important. That's right. That's right. It's so important. So and we got a miracle we want to show you. Yeah, we want to really show you cool, something, something that really happened. Something really cool that happened in, our, in, in this congregation. In, yeah, in this church, and we want you to see what transpired, and then we want to talk about it and tell you because you haven't necessarily been around for all the miracles and things that happened, but we sang a song about cancer being healed, and we have those stories in this church about um, mental health being healed. We have those stories here in this church, but we want you to see one that not everybody knows about. Watch this. So check this out. One Sunday, I was just, we had went out walking with our grandson. We walked the same distance we normally did and came back, and I just seemed to be irritated that day for some reason. I, I couldn't put my finger on it or anything. And then um, my wife was getting ready to fix supper, and she said, well, I'm going to cook. You know, do you need anything? And I went in, sat down in the office, and started doing some, um, some work on a, a, a job that I had. I remember sitting down, and that's it. I didn't get anything else after that, because I don't know what, what happened from there. I was in the floor, and that's all. So I heard him fall, and then when I got to him, I knew it wasn't a joke. Um, I called 911, first call, and they started talking me through doing CPR, which I had no clue how to do at the time. His eyes had rolled back in his head. He wasn't breathing, and I didn't really know what was happening. My next phone call, when the EMTs did arrive, 
was to Pastor Choi. And Pastor Choi and Penny were on vacation in California. And they'll be the first ones to tell you they never get a call from me unless the building's burning down or something's really serious. <clears throat> he took the phone call and he said, what's going on? And I told him what was going on to the best of my knowledge at the moment. And he said, I'm gonna pray. He told her and she started texting people and calling people for prayer. And that's really what changed everything. Um, the EMTs got there, they did compressions, they did shock paddle, I think three times. He was without oxygen for nine to 12 minutes. And we went to the hospital and on the way to the hospital, um, again, God's hand in all of it. I knew the doctor, he was a Christian. He came and met me outside the building and um, took me in and said, you know what we're gonna do? And we did, we prayed, had a Christian nurse. She, everybody was standing around his bed praying. That was the first thing, which was pretty awesome. Them waking me up um, was the, the next thing I remember. They they woke me up, They it was, um, um, a self-induced coma that they put me in because they wanted to chill my body parts down just in case they got me back so that um, that I wouldn't have any problems medically um, when I woke up. And I remember that whenever they were trying to wake me up, um, about three or so days later, um, my remembrance was of Pastor Troy and Pastor Penny. The pastors left their vacation early and came um, and they were there the next morning too. And round the clock, I had people with me, church family, sitting by my side, holding my hand, helping me. I had the pastors there to pray and to talk with me. And I needed to keep my faith strong. And the only way that I could have done any of that is the foundation that we had gotten through the teaching in this church and with our pastors. They had said that he had been without oxygen for so long, they didn't think he would be right again, but God and God had a plan and he put his plan into work. The pastors were there and the church family was there. And you, if you need that in your life, that's when you know for sure that you're hooked into the right place. And they were my shepherd, my pastors, and they were there to walk me through everything and be with me throughout all of it. And he's a miracle. And they called it sudden death syndrome. Um, it's one of those things that if you read about it, it says there's less than a 10% survival rate, but God. Isn't that great? Fantastic, yeah. huh? So Thurman's father, the same age, passed away from that as well as, um, I believe it was his brother, same thing happened. And that is what we call a generational curse, things that try to come down through your bloodline that are cut off at the, the blood of the cross. And I remember when we got that call, we didn't want our kids to hear, so I remember us going out into the hallway I was in a. I was actually in the elevator, in San Francisco. We were on vacation when when I got the call. Yeah, and so we're we're in the hallway, and Pastor Troy began to just literally prophetically. He's like, I see Thurman's spirit hovering over his body, and he began to say, Get back in that body, Thurman Wells. You are not done. You go back into that body and sent his spirit back into his body. From nine to twelve minutes, he was dead gone. And they had to shock him three times to try to get a heartbeat. And they, they chilled him down. And when he, when they put him in that coma for several days and he came up, he, he couldn't remember anybody, didn't know who the president, that's when they asked him who the president was. He, he couldn't remember anything. But I remember, and they, they were just warning us. They said, we want you to know he, he can't remember anything. And some of his family is coming around. They can't, he doesn't know anybody. Pastor Troy walks around the corner, walks into intensive care, and he goes, look, y'all, there's my pastor right there. <laughs> there's Thurman and Debbie right there. Stand up, Thurman and Stand Debbie. Stand up, Thurman and Debbie. Isn't that great? They've been here for a long time. They are permanent fixtures around here. Right. We love them. They have been so vital to us but also they understand what church family is all about. That's right, that's that right. That you need a church family. God did not intend for you to do life alone. 
When you have those moments that are life or death, when you have situations where you're going through something hard or difficult, and the tendency is when we go through hard things is we want to isolate. And I just want to tell you that's not God's highest and best for you to isolate because whatever you keep in the dark stays hidden. But when you bring it to the light, the Bible says that light makes darkness flee. And that's what happened is Thurman was brought back to life That's right. because he was planted in God's house and there were people that could be there. We got this text line going and, and we just started praying. Everybody was intercede, interceding and just believing God for his life. And Jesus raised him back from the dead. And that's what Jesus does. Why don't you stand with me? And, and I know this was a little different for you if you're here and it's maybe your first time uh, being a guest here at Freedom House Church. Hopefully you come back next week. And uh, we ha- we'll have live preachers and all that stuff. This is actually, you know, a big celebration for us. And we're celebrating Jesus first and foremost and what he's done. And um, I just want to just pinpoint that that's what the gospel is all about, is bringing dead things back to life. You know, Jesus came back to life for us. She, he, he is sitting at the right hand of God, uh, ever interceding, praying for you and me. I don't know what you're going through. You know, I, I, I don't know you that well. You know, maybe we've met a couple times. I'd love to meet you, take a picture with you out in the lobby. Um, Stephanie and Aaron said they're, they're taking everybody out to lunch today. So it's good. 20-year <laughs> anniversary. But maybe you got a dream that needs to come back to life. Maybe, maybe your life feels dead. Um, Jesus is in the business of resurrecting things. And he wants to resurrect you today. So I want you to close your eyes, bow your head. Even if you're watching online... For 20 years, we've been doing this, that at the end of every service, we want to give anybody an opportunity to make a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, maybe a dream has died in your life. Maybe you feel like uh, everything's over with. Let me tell you, it is not. You have a future. You have a hope. You have a purpose. You have a calling. And it comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. He came and died for you. He came and was resurrected for you. And his desire is for you to live eternally with him. So if you don't know your your eternal future, if you want to make a decision, maybe it's a decision you made in the past and you came back to church today. Maybe you just tuned in for the first time and you're sitting in a hotel room and you've never watched church before or maybe you've watched church your whole life but you've never met Jesus. Let me tell you, he is right here today. And he wants to change your life. I'm going to count the three in a second. If you say, that's me, I want to do that. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to pray with you. And I want to know who I'm praying for. So that's why I get you to raise your hand. Also, I want you to make a confession today that you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You want to let him be the Lord of your life. And he'll introduce you to a father who cares about you, loves you, um, and, and has a great plan for your life. I'm going to count to three. If you say, that's me, maybe for the first time, or maybe... Maybe for the hundred and first time, you want to make that decision. I want to pray with you. Ready? One, two, three. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. All over the room. Thank you. If you're online, please. Just I know you might be by yourself. Your kid, your kids might be around. Just raise your hand. Make that confession today. I want to pray with you, church family. Can we join with them as they make this confession over their life? Let's all do this together. Just say this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that his blood washes me of all my sins and all my mistakes. Today, I give you my life. I will follow you and I will serve you forever in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap. Isn't that great? We have something super special that we are doing next week and we are having baptisms And we want to make sure that if you have not been baptized in water, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that when you were a baby, you got sprinkled. Because what some people do is they say, well, I got sprinkled as a kid. No, no, no. What the Bible says, it says, since you've been saved. In other words, you've made a decision to follow Jesus. And because you've made that decision, you are now saying, I want to publicly declare that I 
died on the inside and was risen again to new life. And it is an outward symbol of an inward change. Much like a wedding ring, Troy's wedding ring is an outward symbol of an inward commitment that he made. That is what baptism is. It's an outward showing of a commitment internally That's that right. you have made. And the Lord doesn't suggest that we get baptized. He tells us we need to get baptized. It's your way of witnessing to everybody in your life. Your family will come and watch invite, you. Invite we'll your family. You. And now listen, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go, well, you know, I know I need to do it. I'll do it later. No, you won't. You're going to go home. You're going to watch football. You're going to get caught up in the new, you know, Game of Thrones, Netflix thing. No, you don't watch and, Game of Thrones. And, and so whatever, whatever. But you're not. So here's what we're going to do. We have people outside that are waiting for you to sign up. So when you walk out of this auditorium today. I'm going to dismiss you in just a minute. Make sure you grab them and go, hey, I want to get baptized. I want to get dunked in Jesus' name. And so we'll make sure that you can do a cannonball next week. It's going to be um, epic. It's going to be amazing. Invite we're, your we're friends. We're making light of it, but you understand the seriousness that Very God serious. puts on it. So we want to invite you to do that. If your children have not been baptized, people ask us all the time, can my children be baptized? As long as they have made a commitment and they have accepted Jesus in their heart, the answer is yes, and the answer is they need to be. That's right. So we are excited. We will see you next week. Anything else, babe? That's it. You're Go dismissed. enjoy we'll see you today. Later. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday.